A thousand feet in the air, all is quiet and grand. Now gaze to the left, past Will Mountain's cliffs, and marvel at the lay of the land, an open cut beckoning you to explore. And you will, for this is the route of Mountain Thunder. This is a train trip like no other. History hits you in loud bursts. Welcome to the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, a trip full of stunning views and stories. In the next half hour, ride the famed rails and listen to railmen of old, hear about a great race, and bring traces of track back to life. Get ready to look up at the majestic cliffs of myth and take on a legendary curve. Into a mountain tunnel we will barrel, into a bone cave we will crawl, to a museum we'll look upon an American first. Our trip is fast and loud. Well, some don't think so. That's the magic of this journey. It soothes and satisfies both young and old. Now let's head to the Cumberland Station. The year is 1913, and a black and white photo has just turned into a colorful conductor. All aboard! The Western Maryland Scenic Railroad begins in Cumberland, a town where centuries are bridged by a common trait, transportation. Maybe the caveman invented the wheel here. It sure seems like everything else involving travel has a Cumberland connection. The National Road started here. Begun in 1811, it became a gateway to the West, first by stagecoach, later by automobile. The federal government financed the project, making this road the nation's only wholly federally funded and constructed road. By 1836, it turned the road over to the states. To help maintain the road, toll houses were built. In LaVale, you still can see the original, a unique seven-sided structure, two stories tall. Built in 1812, the toll gate house made an immediate impact. Toll up 20,000 travelers during the first year, collecting nearly $10,000. Now, you can drive past the house for free. Tolls haven't been collected here since the turn of the century. The National Road may have been Cumberland's first historic travel achievement, but more would quickly follow. In 1842, a strange steel monster rumbled into town, belching steam. People ran for their lives. They were, uh, they were frightened of it. But since then, we've all gotten used to it. It didn't take long for Cumberland, nicknamed the Queen City, to become the Steam City. Railroads would rule, passengers could get around quicker, and minerals such as coal could be shipped out of the rich Allegheny Mountains. Cumberland was envisioned as a, a major inland port. It would, they predicted it would rival Baltimore as far as its prominence in the state. At that point, Cumberland just thrived due to transportation. It was a stop-off point. People would take the railroad from there. They'd take stage lines or the National Road or the canal. The canal was yet another historic transportation first in Cumberland. It took 22 years and $11 million to build the waterway between Georgetown and Cumberland. And it remains one of America's most ambitious industrial experiments. The canal and the railroad were competitors from the start. Construction on both began on July 4th, 1828, but the railroad easily won the race to Cumberland. The canal would get used to finishing in second place. The canal never made much money. Uh, if you think about it, uh, the canal reached Cumberland in 1850. The railroad reached Cumberland in 1842, eight years before. Both the canal and the railroad moved coal, lots of it. Between 1842 and 1877, the canal and the railroad transported nearly 30 tons of coal. The canal shipped a third of it, the railroad the rest. They navigated side by side uneasily. I think it was very competitive. The railroad, the locomotives would be paralleling the canal in many areas and would, the canalers would claim that the trains blew their horns purposely to stir their mules up. But once off the water, canalers took revenge. We've heard different incidents uh, as far as uh, things being put on the track and trains being stopped. But only temporarily, for the trains were too powerful. Mules were no match. 
I think it was a good idea at the time, 1850s, they were working all over the, all over the world. Uh, but when, when the railroad came in, they were, they were being made obsolete. The canal operation would struggle. It would take a crew five days to travel the 184 and a half mile route. The trip involved passing through 74 locks that would raise or lower water depending on which way you were going. In certain spots like the Paw Paw Tunnel, canal congestion tried a saint's patience. There may be 30 to 40 boats backed up here, and it may take each boat 15 minutes to get through the tunnel. So you can imagine uh, some boats are in here for two, two days just to get through the tunnel. The work proved to be a grueling family affair. Old photos show children chained to the boats. The canal was a miserable place to live. Terribly hard, you froze in the winter, it was hot in the summer. It was work seven days a week. A normal work day was 10 hours. You started at the age of eight. Floods eventually would drive everyone off the canal. This major flood, uh, 18, 87 was fairly bad and then Johnstown came along 1889 and, and really the canal. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal existed in name only. The original route was supposed to run to the Ohio River. It never did and didn't stop in Cumberland. I think as Charles Peralt said it was a, a beautiful failure you know. It, uh, um, there's so much to enjoy today it's a very unique park. The CNO Canal went bust in 1924. At the time, ironically, its old foe, the B&O Railroad, owned it. Today, the canal is part of the National Park Service. The towpath from Georgetown to Cumberland now is a popular trail. The canal itself is still, wind the only movement. Outside, the legendary Paw Paw Tunnel act to a trickle. Inside the tunnel, the walls still try to replenish the canal. One drop at a time. The unpredictable Potomac River used to feed this way of life for so many, a life we can only imagine. Just to be up in the front of the boat and moving along, uh, it was kind of like a, um, maybe an air balloon, where you for anything, you're just cruising along, you can hear the mules, horses clicking along the canal. Today, mules have been replaced by egrets. These warmer summer days going along the canal for a five to seven day boat trip down must have been. An experience today that is only lived out by wildlife. Unlike the canal, railroads survived, thrived in the coal-soaked hills of western Maryland. Steam locomotives and coal went hand in hand. The first railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio, the B and O, blew into Cumberland in 1842 and continued to expand, reaching Pittsburgh in 1849, the Ohio Valley in 1853, and by 1857, the B&O had direct Baltimore, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. Meanwhile, other railroads flourished, mostly short-line tracks transporting coal out of various Allegheny mountain sites. Among them, the Eckhart Railroad, the Georges Creek Railroad, the Piedmont and Cumberland Railway, the Cumberland and Pennsylvania, and of course, the Western Maryland Railway. Started in 1906, it grew into an impressive 700-mile operation spanning three states. This is a, a birthplace of a good many rail lines. I'm sure back then, with all these steam locomotives and all these railroads running through Cumberland, it was probably uh, a, a noisier, dirtier place than it is now. The Western Maryland Railroad made many mountain stops besides Cumberland. The train halted at Cedarhurst and Chewsville, Little Orleans, Old Town, Deal, Pikesville, Sandpatch, Cheat Bridge. Through the beautiful narrows, it rumbled with plenty of company. Talk about a tight squeeze. Like the, the narrows, at one point you had that Pennsylvania Railroad, the, the C&P Railroad, the Georges Creek and Cumberland, and the B&O Railroad all passing through the same water gap. They, they had some competition. 
the Western Maryland Railroad became one of the dominant forces in the area, first buying up many of the smaller railroads and eventually overtaking the C&P line, which provided steady passenger service through Allegheny County. The Western Maryland steam trains were mammoth locomotives, some with attractive pull of nearly 100,000 pounds. But, like the canal before, these wonders soon would fall too. By 1954, the steamers stopped replaced by cleaner and more efficient diesel trains. The days of many railroads were over. In 1973, the Western Maryland Railroad collapsed into the large corporate arms of the CSX, and a rich railroad history began to fade away. The lines were generally abandoned. And never to return. Today, the old Western Maryland Railroad Bridge that crosses the Potomac River sits in loneliness. Only the passing water beneath it and a few fall leaves keep it company now. Trees take the place of iron rails that once gave direction to this bridge. The oldest railroad bridge in Maryland shows wear and tear postmarked by age. Only the water runs fresh here. Water that feeds nature's plants that slowly grow where rails once laid. And yet if you close your eyes, another time comes upon you and then... The whistle blows and you realize mountain thunder still lingers in the air. When they started running the scenic railroad uh, back in the uh, late 80s, my neighbors, their older people, got really nostalgic over hearing that steam whistle. You know, it's so different from a diesel whistle. And they, they really took them back. In 1989, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad began offering trips between Cumberland and Frostburg, along a famous mountain line that climbs nearly 1,300 feet. Among the towns it passes is Mount Savage, where steam clouds reveal historic memories. The tracks no longer come here, but a simple museum proves magnetic to rail lovers. There are more railroad people today than there ever was coming to look at railroad pieces. That's what they want to see is the iron rail. That was the first rolled iron rail in America. It is the holy grail of rails, rolled in Mount Savage by the New York Iron Coal Company. The 1844 achievement freed the country from relying on Europe for finished railroad goods. It also meant the Allegheny mountain area would become lined with rails. These days, roads have replaced the rails that lead to Mount Savage. The Western Maryland Scenic Railroad only passes the town of the distance now, but the historical importance of that railroad town is noted for every passing car. Speaking of history, Here's some more moving down the tracks. On the Western Maryland Railroad since the 19th. Brakeman, flagman, conductor, just a few. Uh, really uh, an experience that you would remember if you lived to be 100. He moves gingerly now, but at one time this 80-year-old man was a boxcar acrobat. Just part of the job. Hop from this car over onto this one. And then on down the train as you go in. He never fell, but trains did go off the track. As he walked away from one bad wreck in West Virginia, an eyewitness asked, Hey, mister, was you on that train? I said, yeah, I was on it riding it there. No, he said, what did you think about whenever it started to wreck? I said, mister, do you go to church on Sunday? What's that got to do? I said, well, if you don't, you better damn sight start, because that's what I'm going to do. Nearby, the lonely and abandoned Frostburg Tunnel shares one sad memory with this railroad man. Brakeman on the last train that went through under Frostburg. Trains no longer puncture the darkness here. Glenn Pryor no longer jumps boxcars. Time's hard freeze in a town called Frostburg. But as Glenn Pryor walks to his home not far from here, he's happy because these mountains are alive with steam.
mountain thunder. That's the forecast for Frostburg. Not all is lost. One rail line still exists. For the Western Maryland sing up the tracks, and another old rail man is at the controls. That's the only job I ever really had. 70 years plus, he could be in a rocking chair, but Harry Forback prefers this front seat. The steam engine is something that you run. It isn't automatic, and it's almost like you talk to it, and it talks back to you. He works with a young crew, passing down a precious craft just like his dad did for him. I want to say it go on for the younger generation. My dad was a railroader, and I've always known railroading. Tickets, please. Conductor Richard Arnold also loves his work. I've been around the railroad since, well, my father was carrying me when I took my first train ride, and I was in diapers. He punches tickets just like his grandfather did on the C&P Railroad. Railroading's in the blood and in the ears. If you can hear, you're hooked. Oh, just like listening to that whistle now, uh, knowing where you are, and it's, it's just something you really can't describe. But when you have goosebumps, you know that uh, you know that's where you want to be. The Western Maryland Scenic Railroad offers only steam travel in the state. The 32-mile round turns its way up the Allegheny Mountain chain from Cumberland to Frostburg. This railroad not only features railmen of old like Harry and Richard, but includes a younger generation working in the background. Old number 734 wouldn't be running today if it wasn't for Dan Pluta, chief mechanical officer for the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad. He spent a year rebuilding the 1916 Baldwin, which had been collecting dust in an Illinois museum. We did all the work here ourselves, and uh, you know it's pretty satisfying to see it run every day. It's a good piece of history, and every kid should grow up knowing what a steam engine is, because you know nobody sees them much anymore. So. I got the Four-year-old Nathaniel's riding a steam train for the first time. Do you like trains, Natty? Yeah. Oh wow! Four years old, going through the heart of Piney Mountain. He's too little to understand that this is brush tunnel, built in 1911. It bores through 914 feet of darkness. Oh, but relax, Nathaniel. There's light at the end of this tunnel. As the train exits the tunnel, it is surrounded by steam, as if it was a ghost train from the past. A ticket back in time. Brush Tunnel is just one of many highlights on the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad. Another is Helmsteader's Curve, named after the dairy farm it passes by. Helmsteader's Curve is a half mile back. People gather regularly on the banks to get a close view of the train. It's one of the most intimate and photographed railroad stretches in America. Another interesting area is Bone Cave. Discovered in 1912 during construction of the railroad, it holds a wealth of clues about our past. And when the railroad's not running, Trent Spielman is crawling through an area that's estimated to be thousand years old. Right now, my main goal is to recover a lot of the bone material that is still here. For 17 years on his own time, Spielman has sift rock, finding fossils. He's carrying on the work of the Smithsonian Institution, which began excavating the area in 1912. The project started after an innocent discovery by a railroad construction worker. The gentleman had seen large pieces of uh, bone being scooped out with the old steam shovels when they were cutting the railroad cut through here. Bones of prehistoric saber-toothed cats and mastodons are just two of the 46 to be recovered, 28 completely extinct. Spielman continues to send his finds to the Smithsonian Institution. He hopes someday another major excavation will occur. Like the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad, he's interested in preserving the past. While Bone Cave is steeped in historical fact, there are other stories that are more, well, imaginative. One of the biggest attractions on the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad is the trip through the Narrows, a mile-long, thousand-foot gorge. 
and high up on the Wills Mountain looms an Indian legend. That's Lover's Leap. Right to the edge of that is where they held hands and jumped off. That's about maybe 1,100 feet high, jumped off to their death to the rocks below. In fact, ask any resident here about Lover's Leap and... The image comes right to their mind, an uh, Indian princess and a settler. There's an element of Romeo and Juliet in there. I've heard it since I was a kid. When I was growing up, there was an SO gas station down there called Lover's Leap Gas Station, and they had a big arrow pointing up to the precipice. As the story goes, sometime in the middle 1700s, an Indian princess and her English lover were denied marriage by Chief Will. Devastated, they made a drastic decision. There is some doubt to the authenticity of the story, but no one questions one thing. The moral of the story is that a life is precious, and a life goes on, and you'll get over it. Don't jump off the cliff. <laughs> In a way, the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad represents that philosophy. It would have been up after the coal boom ended. Easy to let the 1920 Frostburg train depot wither away like her abandoned tunnel. But no, the depot thrives with passengers who get off the train to see this big breathing piece of history turned around. Frostburg is merely the halfway point on this trip of magic, myth, and railroad might. When you stand here in Frostburg and hear that locomotive coming up that mountain, it sounds like a steam will never be dead. Florians, there are steam buffs, there are tourists, there are scenic railroads. I think they'll live forever. The Western Maryland Scenic Railroad is a tiny sliver of what it once was. A 32-mile trip through an area where rails used to wind endlessly. For three hours, passengers experienced the past. In antique depot, and rescued and refurbished rail cars of the 1940s. Pulled by a steam train from the early 20th century. The mountain scenery's been here from the start. Tugging hearts, past is assured. Just listen to the awesome thunder. Beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. It's very romantic. It is. You, you ride the train, you go up to Frostburg, you can have a quiet dinner, come back down. It's, it's, it can be family time. Ride the rails and you'll develop a loyal fondness. Bob and Betty Combs worked the railroads for years. Betty sold tickets for Union Pacific. Bob made sure the trains worked. Well, I worked as a machinist for 38 years. Well, I like to ride, but I don't want to work on them. <laughs> Especially the steamers. They're dirty and they're disagreeable when, when you got to work on them. Well, I'm glad that they're keeping a lot of this equipment that hasn't seen them, hasn't rode. I mean, it, it's really good for the, uh, especially the young the kids in that there. I mean, it's, I'm glad to see that they're doing it. In Cumberland, the railroad industry is still a major part of the city. A giant CSX yard ships cargo throughout the country. The new trains sparkle. Even the headlights seem diamond-like. What a contrast from the dirty shovel, muscle, and fire days of old. Together, the eras talk the language of railroads, but only the steam train can blow nostalgia in a mournful Morse code that translates into an echoing across a sky of steam and cumulus in a biblical travel land, the genesis of curiosity and courage. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard.